If you want to grasp the scale of China's ambition, just follow its railways. Over the last 20 years, China hasn't just built trains, it has redefined what's possible in transportation. Its high-speed rail network now stretches over 48,000 kilometers, enough to circle the Earth more than once. Imagine a ribbon of steel gliding through mountains, rivers, and frozen plains, connecting cities faster than a jet. Here's the kicker. China controls 66% of the world's high-speed rail mileage. Two-thirds of all the bullet trains in the world? That's China. It's not just infrastructure. It's a global power statement. A blend of precision, planning, and national pride moving at 350 kilometers per hour. Now let's throw a curveball. Russia, China's longtime ally, and one of the largest countries on the planet, hasn't finished a single true high-speed rail line. While China's bullet trains cut across the country like veins of steel, Russia is still stuck in the planning stage. So why the massive gap between these two allies? How did China achieve what most nations only dream of? While Russia, with all its resources, lags behind? That's exactly what we're diving into today. Buckle up. It's a journey through ambition, politics, and engineering like you've never seen. China's high-speed rail isn't just fast. It's engineering on a massive scale. Trains zip along at 350 kilometers per hour, slicing through mountains, gliding over rivers, and even crossing frozen plateaus where winter temperatures can drop to minus 30 degrees Celsius or lower. Think about it. Most countries would see these landscapes as obstacles. China sees them as challenges to solve. It's not just about speed. These bullet trains represent precision, planning, and national pride. Every tunnel drilled, every bridge built, and every track laid is a carefully calculated solution to a seemingly impossible problem. In Tibet, trains glide over high-altitude terrain where oxygen is thin. In the Pearl River Delta, they cut through bustling cities with minimal disruption. China's network is also a visual marvel. Imagine sleek silver trains streaking past lush farmland, crossing massive steel bridges over rivers, or disappearing into mountain tunnels. Maps of the network look like a web connecting every major city, showing just how ambitious the plan is. But the story isn't just about rails. It's about what those rails enable. They shrink distances, connect economies, and showcase a country willing to invest decades of planning and trillions of yuan to redefine mobility. China didn't just build trains, it built solutions to challenges that would paralyze most nations. And yet, as impressive as China's network is, the contrast with Russia's ambitions is staggering. That's where our story takes a turn. Now let's turn to Russia. On paper, Russia seems like a perfect candidate for high-speed rail. It has vast territory, major cities spread across thousands of kilometers, and a population eager for faster, more efficient travel. And politically, it's a close ally of China a country that has mastered high-speed rail and could easily share expertise. Yet despite all this potential, Russia hasn't followed China's lead. Its cities remain connected by conventional trains that are slow by global standards, leaving millions of commuters and travelers stuck in journeys that could be cut in half. The opportunity was clear. Russia could have partnered with China to access proven technology, engineering expertise, and financial support. Imagine a Moscow to St. Petersburg bullet train running at 350 kilometers per hour, slicing travel time and transforming the country's transportation landscape. But that didn't happen. Russia made a choice to pursue a path less traveled, a decision that would define its infrastructure, politics, and national pride for years to come. The next chapter in this story is the crown jewel of Russia's plan, the Moscow-St. Petersburg high-speed rail line. At the heart of Russia's high-speed ambitions is the Moscow-St. Petersburg Line, a 708-kilometer corridor designed to connect the nation's political and cultural capitals. On paper, it's brilliant. Reduce a four-hour train ride to just two hours, revolutionizing travel for millions of people and injecting speed and efficiency into the Russian transportation system. But it's more than just travel time. This line was envisioned as a national statement, proof that Russia could modernize, compete with Europe, and launch its own technological renaissance. The project promised to showcase Russian engineering, innovation, and ambition on the global stage. Of course, such an undertaking comes with a hefty price tag. The government estimated the project would cost around 1.7 trillion rubles, roughly $18 billion. That's a massive investment, but the potential payoff, economic growth, 
job creation, and global prestige made it a gamble worth taking. Yet despite all the planning, the project didn't start on time. Year after year, political debates, budget uncertainties, and technical hurdles kept the rails unbuilt. It seemed like the dream might stay on paper forever. But then came a turning point. In August 2023, President Vladimir Putin gave the green light, signaling that the dream was back on track. The question now was bigger than money or politics. Who would build it? That decision would define Russia's approach to the future of high-speed rail. Even with the project officially back on track, the Moscow-St. Petersburg high-speed rail faced a mountain of challenges. Originally planned to start years earlier, the project stalled again and again. Budgets weren't finalized, political support wavered, and technical problems piled up faster than solutions could be found. Then came global disruptions. The COVID-19 pandemic slowed construction everywhere, and Russia's involvement in the war in Ukraine added further strain on resources and logistics. Each delay pushed timelines further out, making the dream of a high-speed corridor seem almost impossible. Despite all these setbacks, the government finally moved forward. Construction teams were assembled, materials started moving, and contracts were signed. Russia's ambition was clear, but so was the biggest question looming over the project. Who would build this rail line? Would Russia rely on foreign expertise like China's world-leading high-speed rail companies or attempt something far more daring to do it all on its own? The answer would shape not just the project, but Russia's approach to technological independence. Building high-speed rail is never easy, but in Russia, the challenge reaches an entirely new level. A huge portion of the country sits on permafrost, ground that stays frozen year-round. At first, that might sound stable, but here's the problem. When the frozen soil thaws even slightly, it shifts and cracks, warping tracks and sinking structures. For trains traveling at over 300 kilometers per hour, even a tiny misalignment can be catastrophic. Then there's the weather. In winter, temperatures in many regions plunge to minus 30, minus 40 degrees Celsius or lower, lasting for months. Pouring concrete, operating machinery, or testing sensitive electronics in that cold isn't just slow. It can destroy materials and break equipment. Construction crews are often forced to pause for weeks, waiting for safer conditions. On top of that, Russia's sheer size and remoteness make logistics a nightmare. Transporting steel, concrete, and machinery across vast, sparsely populated landscapes is expensive, time-consuming, and fuel-intensive. Unlike China, which often builds railways through densely connected regions, Russia's lines cut through isolation. All of this means that even before political or financial decisions come into play, the engineering itself is monumental. The Moscow-St. Petersburg line isn't just a rail project. It's a test of Russia's ability to overcome nature itself. When it came time to decide who could help build the Moscow-St. Petersburg high-speed line, the obvious choice seemed clear. China. After all, China is the undisputed global leader in high-speed rail, with decades of experience building bullet trains that cross mountains, rivers, deserts, and even frozen plateaus. Their trains zip between cities at 350 kilometers per hour, arrive on time with near-perfect reliability, and have been exported successfully to countries like Indonesia, Turkey, and Thailand. China's expertise wasn't the only draw. Their systems are fast, cost-effective, and proven, making them ideal for a country under international sanctions, trying to save money while taking on one of the largest rail projects in its history. Politically, the two nations already cooperate closely on energy, defense, and infrastructure, making collaboration seem almost inevitable. For many observers, the solution was simple. Partner with China, borrow their technology, and accelerate the project while minimizing risk. But here's the twist that shocked analysts worldwide. Russia didn't take the easy route. Despite China being a perfect partner on paper, Moscow made a choice that would set the stage for a far more ambitious, and riskier path. Russia's decision to reject China wasn't about money or capability, it was about control and sovereignty. Allowing Chinese companies to design, build, or maintain the line would have meant relying on a foreign power for one of Russia's most critical infrastructure projects. That dependence could extend far into the future, from spare parts and software updates to ongoing maintenance, creating a situation where Russia might lose its technological independence. From the Kremlin's perspective, this was more than a rail line. It was a test of national self-reliance. 
Accepting outside help might have saved billions and shaved years off the timeline, but it also carried a long-term price dependence on another nation, even one considered an ally. This decision also reflected broader strategic thinking. After the outbreak of the war in Ukraine and the wave of Western sanctions, Russia became hyper-focused on reducing reliance on foreign technology, especially for systems tied to transportation, energy, and defense. In that context, partnering with China, even a close ally, was seen as a risk to national security. In short, Russia turned away from the obvious pragmatic choice because sovereignty and technological independence outweighed short-term convenience. This was a project where politics and pride mattered as much as engineering and efficiency. Choosing to go it alone wasn't just about avoiding dependence. It was also a powerful statement of national pride. By building the Moscow-St. Petersburg high-speed rail entirely with Russian companies, materials, and engineers, the Kremlin signaled that Russia could shape its own future without outside help. The project is also expected to boost the domestic economy. Tens of thousands of jobs will be created. Local manufacturing will get a major stimulus, and Russia's technology sector faces a challenge that could spark homegrown innovation. Think of it as a launch pad for the next generation of Russian engineers and researchers, an incentive to stay in the country rather than seek opportunities abroad. Symbolically, this is about proving that Russia can innovate independently, just like China did over the past two decades. It's not just a rail line, it's a message to the world. Russia is capable, self-reliant, and willing to tackle complex engineering feats on its own terms. In other words, this project is as much about identity and pride as it is about speed and infrastructure. But the question remains, can Russia actually pull it off? That brings us to the next challenge, the technical reality of building a world-class high-speed rail from scratch. Here's where the ambition meets the harsh reality. Russia has never built a high-speed rail system on its own. Its fastest commercial trains, like the Sapsen, top out at under 200 km per hour, relying heavily on imported parts and existing designs. Now, the country is aiming for trains that will run twice as fast, over hundreds of kilometers, across frozen terrain and with safety standards that must last decades. The learning curve is enormous. Russia must design the trains, build new factories, train engineers, and develop software and control systems from scratch. Every delay, design flaw, or material shortage could push the project back and increase costs dramatically. On top of that, the clock is ticking. The plan is to produce the first prototype by 2027 with the full 78-kilometer line operational by 2030. In other words, Russia is attempting in seven years what other countries with decades of experience have struggled to achieve. Financial pressures, harsh weather, and logistical challenges add even more weight. Success isn't guaranteed, but the ambition is undeniable. Russia is betting that its determination and national will can overcome every obstacle, no matter how steep the climb. Going solo comes with a heavy price. Building a high-speed rail system without China's expertise means slower progress, higher costs, and honestly, a pretty steep technical learning curve. Factories have to be constructed from scratch, engineers trained, and every component tested rigorously. Trial and error is, well, inevitable. Public confidence is another challenge. Many Russians, especially in the tech and transportation sectors, are skeptical. They've seen ambitious projects stall before, they know the harsh winter conditions, and they understand that creating a reliable high-speed rail is far more than laying tracks. It involves sensors, software, and, yeah, decades of refinement. The timeline is ambitious. A prototype by 2027 and the full 78-kilometer line by 2030. Every delay or cost overrun will be magnified by the scale of the project and the fact that Russia is attempting this entirely on its own. In short, Russia is playing a high-stakes game choosing national sovereignty and pride over speed and efficiency. Success could inspire a new era of self-reliance, but failure could serve as a cautionary tale of the challenges of going it alone in the modern world. Even though Russia officially rejected China's direct involvement, the reality isn't entirely black and white. China has remained surprisingly quiet and even supportive of Russia's decision. While Chinese companies lost the bidding process, Beijing hasn't publicly criticized Moscow, maintaining the strategic friendship between the two nations. Some experts suggest that behind the scenes, subtle cooperation could still occur. China might quietly provide advice, components, or consulting without making it an official partnership. It's a delicate balance. Russia wants to prove it can stand alone 
but at the same time, it may still rely on friendly allies if unexpected hurdles arise. This situation reflects a larger trend in global geopolitics. Countries are increasingly trying to reduce dependence on the West while exploring partnerships within the East. Russia's high-speed rail project is a perfect example of how nations navigate independence, ambition, and strategic diplomacy simultaneously. The line between self-reliance and collaboration is thin, and Russia's journey shows just how complicated that balancing act can be. So here we are, Russia, a nation with massive ambition, vast territory, and political will, is attempting to build a world-class high-speed rail system entirely on its own. The decision to reject China wasn't just about trains. It was about identity, sovereignty, and proving that true power comes from standing on your own two feet, even when the path is longer, colder, and riskier. Can Russia succeed? Technically, yes, but it won't be easy. Building high-speed rail from scratch requires years of trial and error, billions of dollars, and a workforce ready to compete with the best in the world. Right now, Russia lacks experience, standardized systems, and mass production capabilities. What it does have is determination, political backing, and a vision for independence. If successful, the Moscow-St. Petersburg line could become a historic achievement, a symbol of resilience and self-reliance. If it falters or drags on too long, it will be a reminder that global cooperation still matters, especially in a world where technology moves faster than any one nation can master alone. So here's the question for you. Was it wise for Russia to go solo and invest in its own future, even if it means delays and higher costs? Or should it have partnered with China, a proven leader, to achieve faster results with fewer risks? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel, where we explore the stories behind the headlines and uncover the hidden forces shaping our world. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.